So welcome to our fifth recess argument of distinguished lecture. This event is organized by the Rethinking the Serviceability of Economics to Society Recess Project, which is funded by the Finnish Cultural Foundation. The Recess Project organizes events and seminars on economics and its role in society. It brings together researchers and practitioners who share an interest in understanding how economics affects the world around us. Today, we have the pleasure of hosting a distinguished lecture by Professor Danny Roderick, who has contributed more than anyone else to the rethinking of economics and its role in policymaking. Danny Roderick is fourth foundation professor of international political economy at the Harvard Kennedy School. He has published widely in the areas of economic development, international economics, and political economy. His current research focuses on employment and economic growth in both developing and advanced economies. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the inaugural Albert Hirschman Prize of the Social Science Research Council. I am particularly excited because Professor Roderick is one of my favorite economists. His books, such as One Economics, Many Recipes and The Globalization Paradox have shaped my thinking about economics and economic policy. He has also contributed significantly to economic methodology, particularly with his frequent commentary on economics and his excellent book, Economics Rules. Professor Roderick is also the co-director of the Reimagining the Economy program at the Kennedy School and of the Economics for Inclusive Prosperity Network. As you can see, it's no coincidence that Danny Roderick will be delivering one of our distinguished lectures today. Danny Hojam, many thanks for agreeing to give this talk. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Amra. It's, it's very nice to be uh, with you uh, virtually. Um, and the, the the topic of my uh, presentation is something that's uh, very much uh, in the news and in the uh, sort of the, the fashion of policies uh, these days, which is uh, industrial policy. And um, I want to um, talk uh, broadly about um, uh, what we know about industrial policy and um, and also how I think uh, we need to reshape it um, for the future. And um, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, start by giving a, a little bit of an overview of the thinking on industrial policy. Um, it's it's um, even though it's something that has returned, uh, to intellectual fashion, and lots of ec economists are now working on industrial policy, you know, under different names. Sometimes it's industrial policy, sometimes it's innovation policy, sometimes it's place-based policies or regional policies. They're really all sort of um, variants of the same thing, and I'll give you uh, a more um, uh, uh, formal definition uh, in a second. But there's always been a tension in economics between uh, two traditions, um, one of which, you know, we may want to associate with um, the names of um, economists like Adam Smith and David Ricardo that sort of uh, emphasize the role of markets in allocating resources efficiently, uh, with David Ricardo in particular, sort of the notion of comparative advantage um, and how um, a free trade allocates uh, resources to their most efficient users and a kind of a cont contending tradition uh, in the history of thought that uh, goes back to uh, Alexander Hamilton, one of the of course, founders of the uh, United States, um, um, and, uh, and Friedrich List, uh, a German-American economist, um, both of whom sort of stressed that particularly for countries uh, that were trying to catch up to the uh, um, technological frontier, it would be very, um, important to deploy what today we would call uh, industrial policies, and they are emphasize in, in particular the role of protective trade policies uh, to promote infant industries and, 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 and stimulate uh, technological, uh, technological um, uh, upgrading. Um, even though the, the, uh, the, the practice of industrial policy, I mean, even though sort of industrial policy is now much more 
um, out in the open and, and, and the Biden administration um, uh, talks about it um, very explicitly. The reality is that um, the, the, the actual practice of industrial policy has always been around. Um, and that's even true when we look at um, sort of uh, very conservative, uh, market-friendly uh, politicians or policymakers um, like um, Reagan or Thatcher or Pinochet that we, we certainly don't associate uh, with industrial policies. When you look a little bit more closely at what they've done, you always find uh, that there was a significant amount of industrial policy going on with uh, Reagan uh, protecting uh, steel, autos, motorcycles against the Japanese, uh, Margaret Thatcher, uh, you know, sort of actively promoting inward uh, foreign investment from the Japanese firms to revive the, US, the UK auto industry. And Pinochet, of all people, that probably the one you might think the least as um, having engaged in industrial policy, having very active uh, subsidy programs in the forestry uh, sector in Chile to promote um, uh, uh, agro-industrial uh, exports. Um, now, uh, and typically, um, uh, industrial policy um, ha is, is deployed uh, in pursuit of a variety of goals, and that's sort of one of the things that I want to focus on in particular in, this, in the second half of, of my presentation. But you can think of industrial policy focusing on industrialization, on innovation, on green transition today, the security of and the resilience of supply chains, uh, the good jobs agenda, which will be a particular focus of my talk during my the second half of my presentation. Of course, you know, geopolitical competition between uh, the West and China and so forth. There's all these sort of variety of, of objectives that are today being tagged on uh, to industrial policy. But what is industrial policy? Uh, so here is the, the definition I, I promised. Um, I would call industrial policy as any um, policy, any government policy that explicitly, that is explicitly targets the transformation of uh, the structure of economic activity in pursuit of some uh, public goal. So uh, the emphasis here are, are, are two things. One is that there is an explicit targeting, that is that all kinds of policies have general equilibrium impacts. Uh, you invest in education, in, and that's you know going to have differential impact on different parts of the uh, economy. We don't necessarily think of that as as industrial policy because it's not explicitly targeting the expansion of one part of the economy. And, and the second is is really the focus on the structure of the economy, the allocation of resources. That's sort of what government is explicitly targeting is uh, is changing the structure of the economy, and. Implicit in in the in the conduct of industrial policy is the if it's favoring certain activities, certain uh, sectors, certain types of technologies, it's also implicitly disfavoring others. So the you know the implicit message with industrial policy is we promote X, uh, but not Y. Of course, you know sort of by in general equilibrium, if you're promoting certain activities. Uh, you must be uh, effectively taxing others. Although, of course, industrial policy, when you, you know, policymakers rarely actually talk uh, about sort of, you know, the 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 second part of this and and the uh, the, the, the 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 this this favoring of certain sectors is implicit. Um, so traditionally, you know, the the goal, the public goal that uh, industrial policy has pursued, um, has been really sort of manufacturing, um, high tech sectors. Uh, but uh, need not be. And I think today, in fact, uh, the um, the goals of, of, of um, uh, uh, industrial policy are becoming much broader, specifically targeting green industries for one. Um, and then as I will focus um, later on, I think services are actually becoming an important part of the agenda as well, or should be, I'm going to argue, uh, because that's really where the jobs of the future are. Now, the instruments of uh, uh, industrial policy are, are, are very, very uh, diverse. Um, often empirical work has focused on very specific measures like uh, tariff protection or subsidies, but really the conduct of industrial policy encompasses a much broader set of instruments uh, having to do in particular with sort of coordinating activities of various public uh, private uh, um, uh, agents as well as the provision of very specific public inputs in ways that I'm going to be making uh, clearer uh, in, in a second. Finally, I think one thing, one, one notion that often uh, um, uh, is associated with industrial policy is the notion of conditionality that 
um, that certain sectors are given support in return for certain performance criteria. And this, con this conditionality can be very hard and explicit. That is, you know, we lo you lose support in three years of condition, you know, why has not been satisfied, or it can be very soft in the sense of just, you know, we're going to monitor and ensure that you're, you're engaged in, in good faith efforts uh, to meet the, the public objective. Now, the rationale for industrial policy, um, and I want to emphasize this, there is no shortage of good economic rationales or theoretical rationales for industrial policy. There are essentially um, three different types of, of um, economic arguments. One focuses on uh, externalities or spillovers. Um, so any type of learning externality spillovers um, are, are sort of are, would be obviously one um, uh, uh, argument for why you want to uh, promote industries where um, that are subject to these learning or other types of externalities. Um, a second category really has to do with coordination uh, failures. Uh, that is that in the presence of, of scale economies, fixed costs, and um, that um, that you know uh, that investment decisions might be complementary. Uh, that is that um, you know that that uh, investment upstream might depend on the presence of investment downstream, and therefore you need to coordinate investments so that um, uh, create clusters or, or, or supply chains that would be uh, eventually profitable, but only when such coordination uh, takes place. Uh, so that would be a second, a second sort of broad category of arguments for industrial policy. And a third category I would say is, is um, sort of um, the 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 the, the uh, missing public inputs. That is a sort of these are uh, not public goods in the general in the sense that um, that they they benefit all producers because in that case it wouldn't really be a conduct of industrial policy. But these are inputs uh, that might benefit uh, simultaneously um, a, a range of firms in a particular region or a particular industry. So these are highly firm or industry specific public inputs that might need to be provided. And this could be customized training uh, that is specific to a particular industry, a particular type of infra infrastructure, um, you know, sector specific standards of legislation or legal or administrative frameworks, um, and that the provision of these kinds of public inputs that are highly customized uh, to the needs of particular clusters or particular regions or particular industries, I think, um, uh, also provide a rationale uh, for, for industrial policy. So uh, the, the, the presence of these theoretical um, rationale is not disputed. It is our, this is basically you know, bread and butter you know, economics um, and that these kinds of things are, are very much, we always, we study them. So the dispute, uh, when people dispute or in, in sort of when there's debates about industrial policy, it's not really about the theoretical rationales, whether these kinds of, of uh, rationales exist. It's really much more uh, about sort of practical arguments uh, about whether governments can effectively carry out industrial policy. And there are two sort of broad critiques um, of industrial policy. And, 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 and um, one has to do with inadequate information. The other has to do with politics. Um, the, um, the, the, um, uh, the argument about information is that Yes, we know that there are all these sort of rationales, you know, market infection spillovers, possibilities of coordination failures, the need for public inputs and so forth, but that that governments really, you know, can never have uh, the information uh, needed for them to make the right choices that, of, you know, where we'll be providing these inputs, where we'll be focusing on these kinds of sectors as opposed to others. So that, and that goes with the, uh, with the you know sort of the, the most often heard critique of industrial policy, which is the government cannot pick winners. Governments don't know where these uh, uh, these these failures occur. Um, and the second is is really much more a, a political economy argument that that even if the government had the you know, actually the knowledge um, that underlying political economy would prevent governments from making the right kinds of choices, that once the government is in the business of picking sectors or activities or technologies, that it becomes hostage to this game of rent-seeking 
and political lobbying and political pressures that uh, the process of industrial policy would be overtaken by politics and it would be uh, these political motives that uh, would dominate uh, or rather than sort of the economic rationale. So this is really, these are the two fundamental uh, critiques for, for industrial policy and why traditionally economists uh, in recent decades have become, have, have been very sort of negative uh, on, 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 um, on, uh, on industrial policy. So uh, the debate then on industrial policy revolves not really around its economic or, or theoretical merits, but around sort of very sharply conflicting views uh, regarding the uh, significance and the pervasiveness of these practical uh, objections. So on the one hand, you'd have people, mostly sort of mainstream economists, to say, look, you know, look how difficult it's really going to be for governments to be, you know, engaged in picking winners and doing this, you know, insulated from sort of day-to-day rent-seeking politics. Um, and others who would sort of say, but, you know, look, you know, countries have done it. Look at East Asia, look at how successful industrial policy has been in East Asia and so forth. So that's, you know, loosely speaking, sort of if you had a, a, a traditional debate on industrial policy between a proponent and a criti cri critic, this is really how that argument uh, argument uh, would go. So um, let me just, you know, sort of, you know, I want to talk a little bit about what empirical work actually tells us. But as, as, a, as a prelude to the empirical work, let me just sketch a kind of a framework where we have sort of these arguments uh, all built in. And then we can ask the question of, you know, what can empirical evidence can, can really tell us? So this is a very, uh, you know, um, a simple framework, but it's also in some ways it's rich in the sense that it's incorporating all this, um, uh, these, these wrinkles, um, both the rationales and the possible critiques into the argument. Um, so suppose that, that, you know, we have some measure of, of economic performance. This is captured in this function G. Um, and this uh, economic performance is going to depend on the one hand, um, sort of what is the sort of the fundamentals, the sort of, if you will, this captured in this parameter A, which is um, the, the underlying level of performance. And this could be at the level of individual sectors, individual activities, and so forth. So this A captures the underlying uh, strength, the fundamentals of uh, a particular sector or set of firms. Uh, but that there is, a, you know, the performance uh, of this sector could be undercut by some market failure, um, uh, which is here captured by theta. Um, that is that the larger the theta is, the bigger the market failure, and therefore the lower um, the, um, uh, the, perf the actual performance relative to the underlying latent performance of this sector. So the theta undercuts, the magnitude of the market failure undercuts the potential uh, of this sector. Um, so um, it reduces um, uh, performance compared to A. But uh, the government has this policy to countervail, and that's, of course, this in, its industrial policy, S. So it's a subsidy that might countervail uh, the market failure. So it could effectively reduce um, uh, the, the effective market failure. And that's why it, it enters the way it does in this first equation. Um, and so, um, and then, of course, the use of uh, the subsidy uh, is going to also bring potentially some costs, which are uh, captured in this uh, function um, alpha, uh, which is the the you know a convex cost of the government intervention that is going to be increasing in the use of the subsidy. It could be because of, you know, the rising. Um, you know, um, uh, you know, cost of you know government funds, for example, that you need to raise in order to pay for the subsidy, um, and also there's a you know the parameter phi, which is that you know government also may be ineffective, the capacity of the government to deploy these subsidies. So there's also that also enters negatively in the performance. So the costs that are on the one hand that you know may, you might not have the capacity, and secondly that you know when you're using these subsidies, uh, you need to raise the taxes, and there will be marginal cost of funds. Now the government actually cares not only about um, economic performance, so it cares about G, but also might have a political motive, and the political motive of transferring grants or resources. Uh, to a particular sector is captured by this pi of S function, right? The pi is the political benefits of government intervention. 
So the actual utility function, the actual you know uh, objective function of the government is a weighted average of the economic and the political motives where the parameter lambda is the relative weight that the government places on economic performance. So we have essentially now put everything in the air. We have the economic motive, you know, to offsetting externalities. We have the cost of the intervention. We have, you know, government capacity. Uh, we have the political motive um, and, and so forth. So um, we can think about what we want empirical evidence to tell us using a framework like this is really whether a government is acting in one of these three different um, um, uh, uh, ways. You know, ideally, sort of with those who, who say, who look at East Asia and say that industrial policy has worked are basically want evidence in favor of what one might call a developmental government, that a, one, a government actually acts in a way that's largely maximizing economic performance, as actually has you know good capacity, or can identify externalities and and, and so forth. Uh, a second type of a government, it might be simply a government that's sort of purely ineffective, that doesn't have the capacity. It might be well-meaning in the sense of knowing actually where these externalities are, but has very low capacity and and kind of and 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 cannot actually implement industrial policy well. And third, we might have a, a kind of a corrupt government, uh, which is that that essentially it, it puts very low weight on economics, so lambda is very low, um, and, uh, and, and is actually targeting intervention on politically well-connected sectors. So it's the political motive that is going to be. So in some sense, you know, the the all these three types of governments are sort of would be, you know, different parameterizations of that objective function um, uh, that, that I just put out. And what ideally we would want empirical evidence to do is, is to be able to discriminate um, through um, observables, uh, whether we, what mix, what exact mix of government behavior we're actually uh, uh, observing when we look at the conduct of industrial policy. So what can actually evidence teach us? The problem is that you know the, the you know the, some of the key parameters here are actually you know are not um, uh, you know observed. They're not observables. We do not observe theta, which is the market failure parameter. We don't observe phi, which is uh, you know government capacity, and we don't observe the actual weight that government puts on economic versus political motives um, here, um, the, the lambda. Instead, what we observe, and that's going to be what we need to use in our in our evidence, is basically we see we can observe economic performance, that is G. We can also observe how much the government is intervening, that is the size of the S. So that is what we're observing. Now, what a lot of the work in uh, the uh, empirical work on on uh, industrial policy did until very recently was really to simply look at the you know, correlation between G and S. Um, that is to say, um, you basically um, uh, um, look at sort of how, um, um, sorry, uh, you look at how you know, um, uh, performance across firms or across sectors in a country varies with the level of government intervention. So this, um, you know, sort of this early um, um, work on, on South Korea or Japan uh, in the 80s and the 1990s that simply correlate to the level of intervention, whether it's a subsidy or level of trade protection um, uh, with um, some measure of performance such as exports or, or, or TFP growth or labor productivity growth. Um, now, the problem is that, you know, simply um, looking at this correlation, uh, actually cannot distinguish at all uh, among these three alternative uh, views of the government, the developmental, uh, the effective, uh, or the ineffective, or the, um, uh, the corrupt governments. In fact, the, the, you know, when one analyzes the framework that I just uh, presented very briefly, the developmental and corrupt government, uh, governments are actually observationally equivalent in terms of their prediction of the model with respect to the cross-sectional correlation uh, between G and S. 
In both cases, actually, the correlation between G and S is negative. Um, it, it's negative in the case of the corrupt government because the corrupt government is actually, you know, um, uh, uh, actively um, uh, subsidizing the wrong sectors. But it's also negative in the case of the developmental government because a, a welfare maximizing or an economic performance maximizing government would not find it optimal to offset the market failure completely in view of the fact that you know using as s is costly so it's because of the convex cost of s so it would not be in the interest of a, a even a, a purely developmental government to completely offset the externality uh, with the consequence that in fact the uh, even government intervention uh, makes the worst performing sectors perform better on account of offsetting the externality, uh, it doesn't completely eliminate uh, it. And therefore, you still have uh, that uh, that government intervention is actually going to be um, higher in those sectors that tend to perform negatively relative to the um, um, counterfactual that matters because the, the, the externality is not, the, the market failure is not completely offset. So the paradoxically, um, if the uh, you know the, the, the you know sort of observing uh, that government intervention and um, uh, performance is negatively correlated, cannot actually distinguish between whether we're observing a government that's doing the right thing or a government that is doing the wrong thing. And with respect to, um, uh, you know, sort of under what circumstances, given this model, we would actually observe a positive relationship between a G and S. It's really, it's only under the extreme assumption that capacity constraints or the variation in phi is the only thing uh, that's driving the variation in the data. And that's, of course, a, a very, uh, very, very strong, uh, very strong assumption. So, um, so. Obviously, this this should sound familiar to you because what we're doing and what we're you know here is trying is doing something that's you know is illegitimate that we're actually looking at correlation between two things that are endogenous G and S uh, that are both responding to other fundamentals, and um, and because government intervention is endogenous and responding to a diverse set of influences, we cannot immediately read off anything that matters from a causal inference standpoint. Uh, from the correlation between uh, uh, G and S. So, uh, the, you know, the, the immediate, um, uh, you know, there's apparently an immediate remedy that 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 uh, you, one can think of, which is to say, maybe we can solve the problem by uh, essentially using sources of exogenous variation in G. Can we identify some component of G that is actually exogenous, uh, or you know, could be some uh, you know, some random component of policy, you know, using some instrument, instrument variable technique or using historical accidents for variation in support for across different types uh, of government intervention in different sectors, and then try to do causal inference uh, in that way. Now, you could do that, uh, but you're not really going to be uh, convincing the skeptics um, of uh, either the, you know, the, the, the proponents or the critic. And let me explain why. Suppose that we actually do do this, and we we do um, uh, estimate a relationship between G and S, where you know we've extracted the random or exogenous component of G, and and then see if it has any effect uh, on. I'm sorry, the um, the random component of S um, uh, that is um, uh, this this G, by the way, should be. Um, uh, in the slide should be really S. So apologies for that. So it's really what we want to do, look at is the uh, exogenous component of government intervention, which is S. Uh, so I think I, I, I just misspoke here and I just, uh, there's a typo on the slide. So it should be S. So suppose that we can we can extract a uh, random or, or exogenous component of S and see whether it has any effect on, on, on outcomes. Um, and then, uh, so we have strong causal identification because we have a plausible instrument or exogenous component. And then um, can we resolve the question of whether industrial policy actually works or not? And I would argue that even then, you know, we really can't, uh, you know, do a very good job of answering this question because uh, 
you know, let's take, you know, both possibilities where we have a positive outcome or a negative result. So suppose we have a positive result, um, which is to say that actually uh, the exogenous component of S has a positive effect on performance, okay? Then uh, the opponent or the critic of industrial policy would say, yes, but that's really not answering the question um, uh, that, that we care about, because my whole argument is that in practice, industrial policy is not random. It will be politically driven. Uh, it will depend specifically on some political features of these, and that uh, these results do not, do not directly speak to, those, to, to the realistic case where, in fact, uh, uh, the use, the exercise of industrial policy will be driven especially by political motives. Uh, so if you just tell me that some random sprinkling of industrial policy has positive effects, that's not the case that I'm worrying about. The case I'm worrying about is where industrial policy will be used for uh, for political um, uh, uh, purposes, and that is the relevant cases. If, on the other hand, we get a negative result, which is to say that um, you know the use of government intervention has a negative effect on 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 uh, econ on performance. Then the proponent of industrial policy will similarly say, yes, but you know, I never argued that random use of industrial policy would be good. I argued that, in fact, governments on balance would be good at pre you know, predicting which sectors they should promote. So therefore, these results do not speak directly to whether subsidies that would be relatively appropriately targeted uh, could make uh, could, could, could be uh, beneficial. So this is actually the central difficulty of causal inference, which I don't think, therefore, industrial, you know, sort of, you know, empirical evidence on industrial policy will ever really be able to resolve for us, um, uh, um, uh, given the nature of the debate, whether industrial policy in general works or not. Now, I don't think we need to be extremely nihilistic because sort of I don't want you to take you, to, you know, in the direction to say that well, you know, we don't learn anything from evidence. Um, you know, sort of, we do learn from evidence, but we do learn sort of ways of triangulating this question rather, rather than directly trying to answer it um, heads on. Um, so, in this uh, recent uh, paper that uh, Reka Joash, uh, Nathan Lane, and I put together for the annual review of economics, so we we do a kind of a survey of the more recent vintage. Uh, literature or industrial policies and place-based policies and similar policies in other domains. And then we sort of say that, you know, sort of what is this, what can this actually tell us in light of these sort of conceptual difficulties? So I think there are two types of things that we can actually learn. One is that we can actually learn on whether sort of, you know, whether the type of externalities on which industrial policy focuses tend to be, tend to exist and whether they're actually important. Um, so one brand of empirical evidence, for example, looks at historical or geographical ex 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 accidents that tend to produce, that tend to favor certain sectors and harm others. And the question is, do they actually these produce longer term productive effects? Um, so just to take, uh, you know, the example of Reka Yuash's paper, you know, if during the ne Napoleonic blockade, if, um, you know, certain you know, French garment, French textiles um, uh, firms received some protection because of blockades of trade. Uh, did they actually eventually uh, end up producing, uh, becoming more productive and, and becoming uh, uh, more uh, uh, profitable over the long term? Um, so this would be consistent with the presence of long-term dynamic learning effects, which is sort of one of the standard rationales for in infant industry promotion and so forth. Um, uh, and so there's a series of papers that look at geographical or historical accidents and how this might have long-term impacts on the structure of productivity and structure of economic production. The second type of question is really when we're talking about actual government policy uh, and ask the question, not whether government policy is targeting um, you know, market failures or externalities or coordination issues that we really cannot observe. But just the simple question, does, does government policy really affect uh, the structure of economic activity? Can it, can it have important and lasting effects on the structure of economic activity? 
uh, so do subsidy or various types of incentive pro programs produce increases in output, investment, or employment in those sectors or firms or regions that they actually target? Um, and uh, there's a, a range of papers that use either difference in differences or in instrumental variables techniques to try to ident ident to answer this question in the context of regional policies uh, in Europe, uh, for example. And 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 um, and. And, and the, the bottom line from both of these two strands of, of evidence uh, is that, in fact, you know, unlike the kind of, you know, uh, crude, theoretically uninformed and empirically uh, problematic, uh, you know, sort of correlational work uh, of the 80s and 90s on industrial policy, uh, that this newer evidence uh, generally suggests a much more positive view uh, on industrial policy, both in terms of the relative effectiveness of government policy in on uh, being able to affect the structure of economic activity, the second question here, as well as as um, the the you know sort of suggestive evidence on the presence of of learning or dynamic effects, um, which are sort of the, the the rationales for these types of of, of policies. Okay, so. Um, I want to, um, you know, in the last um, you know, 10 minutes or so, I want to move a little bit um, to sort of more the normative side um, of, of this discussion about sort of, you know, where I would like industrial policy uh, uh, to be going. Um, and, and I think sort of the premise on this is that, you know, for reasons that by now I, I hope will be clear, that that you know the you know the 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 question of whether government should be uh, um, pursuing industrial policy is not a particularly useful or productive question, um, regardless of you know the conclusion we might want to reach, uh, and and despite sort of regardless of the ambiguity of the evidence on this, that governments are doing it anyhow. And so the much more useful debate to have uh, on industrial policy, I think, is, is the question about how, um, you know, and in that sense, industrial policy is really no different from any other domain of industrial policy where, you know, uh, where policies can fail, whether it's education policy, macroeconomic stabilization, uh, you know, uh, energy transition policies or infrastructure or fiscal policy, where we understand that government policy can fail uh, because you know the, you know market failures arguments for intervention can be exploited by powerful insiders or overwhelmed by informational asymmetry. So in that sense, it's really not nothing special about industrial policy. These are same arguments can and have been made about uh, government policy in other domains as well. Uh, the difference is that in those other domains, we always we're we, we we productively engage in questions about how to improve policy, not on whether government should engage in, you know, fiscal policies or should have you know education or social insurance policies and so forth. So um, in in it, I want to emphasize that one of the most important domains in which industrial policy can make a difference uh, and should make a difference going forward uh, is something that is actually receiving not enough. Um, uh, uh, attention as it should. And here I want to put um, sort of the objective here stated as the objective of good jobs. Um, and I, I want to emphasize why I'm sort of, you know, saying, you know, good good jobs. Um, so maybe I should first say what a good jobs is, but, you know, good job I look at as, as, as sort of good jobs that, that enable um, at least a kind of a path to middle class living standards uh, with core labor protections and, and collective bargaining rights and so forth, and, and certain amount of agency and autonomy for the worker, uh, career ladders and so forth. And, and by now, there's a range of, of different um, operational quantitative indicators of good jobs. It's something that you know we can actually uh, measure and, and survey. So I'm not. I don't want to say much more about that. Just but just to sort of get you to get fix the idea of what a good job is. And um, and the reason that that I want to emphasize a good job is a priority for economic policy is, is the evidence that we have from the last two, two or three decades is how um, the sort of various shocks to labor markets that have taken the form 
of um, trade shocks, globalization, automation, and other new technologies, fiscal austerity shocks, and so forth, have been linked to a very wide range of not just economic malfunction, but also social and political malfunction. Uh, in terms of you know societies um, suffering from uh, you know broken families, uh, drug abuse, criminality, um, you know the rise of political polarization and the rise of populist parties, the creeping increase in authoritarian values and so forth. Um, so you know in in, a, in an economist term, and I, this is something which sociologists have known for a long time, but from an economist standpoint, we can think about sort of good jobs in any particular locality or region being a very source, very important source of positive externality in terms of being the foundation of a middle class and, and producing significant uh, um, social and political externalities for the, for the maintenance of uh, democratic politics and, and, um, and, and cohesive uh, uh, inclusive societies. So that's sort of the argument for why I think uh, I think you know, sort of good jobs are important because their sort of relative disappearance and the shocks to labor markets related to sort of labor market polarization and so forth have been at the root of many of our of our uh, uh, problems in the last few decades. But what does you know what you know what do what do good jobs really have to do with industrial policy? What's the connection? Uh, the typical sort of you know discussion. On, on on good jobs, uh, you know, focuses on on sort of the um, you know you know increasing training and education, or maybe sort of you know improved labor market uh, standards in institutions. There are arguments about how sort of the, the self interest of the employers, uh, you know, might uh, play an important role in 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 the creation of of of, of good jobs. Uh, but you know, these are, I think, potentially all the important remedies, but they also have limits. Uh, you know, so our, our, you know, the standard focus on, on education, skills, and training, um, uh, you know, I think are not just only take a long time, there's also we don't have very good models that scale up. And of course, sort of make, trying to create good jobs by uh, having high standards of um, uh, minimum wages and things like that might create tensions uh, with employment levels um, and, 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 and so forth. So ultimately, when you think about sort of how you create good jobs, it, you, know, it, you know, the only way you can sustainably create uh, good jobs is really uh, with a strategy that's based on productivity, that is, you know, increasing the demand for relatively less educated, lower skilled workers by increasing the productivity uh, of their of of um, such workers, but not just you know by uh, um, uh, skills and training, but also by by increasing the demand for them on the on the part of firms that actually employ them. So it has to sort of you know stimulate the firms that actually um, uh, um, employ uh, these kinds of, of 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 workers as well. So um, so. And that's, I think, it leads us to um, a kind of, of a strategy, uh, uh, industrial policy strategy that would put good job creation front and center, uh, that would, would focus on the demand side of labor markets that is working with firms, in addition to the supply side of labor markets as investment in skills and training. Um, and as I'll say um, uh, in a second, has to focus you know, much more on services than manufacturing. And that, that takes the notion that higher productivity is the sine qua non of good jobs for less educated workers as a minimum complement, as a necessary complement uh, to high uh, labor standards such as uh, minimum wages. So uh, what kind of a change and you know, would that entail in our conception of industrial policy from sort of standard types of industrial policy? One very important shift is that it necessarily uh, gets us to focus on services rather than manufacturing. Uh, you know, for the simple fact um, that uh, that that jobs um, are not and will not be in manufacturing today in the United States, the share of um, uh, employment in manufacturing is below eight and a half percent of the total labor force, and this share keeps falling uh, even. Uh, as um, chips and IRA and all these sort of manufactured focusing, manufactured focused industrial policies in the United States 
are boosting uh, the output and investment uh, in manufacturing. And that sort of reflects the fact that manufacturing has now become so uh, little, such so, you know, has is, 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 is essentially so capital and skill intensive that it's not really absorbing uh, labor. Uh, so therefore, uh, the future of industrial policy is necessarily uh, when you're focusing it from the standpoint of creating good productive jobs is going to be in necessarily uh, in services. Um, and, and let me just sort of say one more thing about that, about sort of how, in fact, employment uh, and output have become uh, disconnected in manufacturing. So I want to sort of look at, you know, there are many countries here, but I want you to look at South Korea in particular. So South Korea is a country that has been ex extremely successful in uh, in manufacturing, as we know. And if you look at the, the share of manufacturing output at constant prices in GDP, which is the red line here, you can see that actually it has continued to increase and it sort of is really stabilized in the last 10 years or so, but it's still relatively high at nearly 30% and hasn't really fallen. Uh, but, but look at what has happened to manufacturing employment uh, as a share of, of employment, and it's sort of you know steadily decreased. Um, so here's a case where uh, you know the manufacturing output has been very successful and becoming globally more competitive manufacturing have been extremely successful. And if you know, as a result of today's industrial policies, the United States would be half as successful as South Korea has been in the last few decades. You know, the administration and its its current architects would would say this is a huge success of let's say chips. But look at you know what has happened in employment. That's not going to help uh, creating sort of re, you know sort of restoring the middle class uh, through um, increases in employment in in manufacturing. So regardless of what these programs do. Uh, for manufacturing output, I'm very skeptical that it can actually increase a lot of uh, employment in manufacturing, and that's sort of why I think we'll need to move towards thinking of, of uh, um, industrial policies for services. Um, second, um, you know, sort of kind of, of change in how we think about um, uh, um, industrial policy is that, you know, typically Industrial policy, we think about just giving subsidies, fiscal incentives, tax incentive to firms so that they will invest in particular regions or in particular types of technologies on particular types of product. Um, I think increasingly we're developing evidence that if you want to create uh, jobs in a region or in an industry, it's far more effective uh, to provide firms with customized public services as particular public inputs. Um, and this could be, you know, uh, particular uh, training for workforce development, particular type of management training, access to specific technologies that are relevant to that uh, set of firms, uh, green fields, regulatory assistance, and perhaps also sort of, you know, financing credit when it's needed. Uh, but with respect to the sort of relative cost effectiveness of these you know, public input provision to attract and retain and grow firms, um, uh, that those are much more cost effective uh, per uh, job created than actually sort of tax incentives or subsidies. And when we look at sort of where the focus is, is where the spending actually goes, there's a huge imbalance uh, that, you know, the you know, annual spending uh, in the United States on subsidies and tax incentives is around sort of $50 billion a year Whereas these sort of programs of customized training and um, helping with manufacturing extension, brownfield development, those are sort of or, or the order of about $1 billion a year. So there's a huge imbalance between where our resources are going to uh, compared to uh, where they would be most effective in terms of actually um, the creation of good jobs. Um, third, um, uh, in terms of where I think our, our, our focus uh, needs to be in terms of these new brands of industrial policies, particularly when we focus on, 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 on good jobs, is directly focusing on um, how we can stimulate more labor-friendly technologies. And what I mean by labor-friendly technologies are technologies uh, that, unlike automation, for example, or uh, digital tools that... Um, uh, replace sales and clerical workers, simply do what they were doing. 
um, tools and new technologies that actually augment what relatively less skilled workers can do, uh, can complement them, can help them uh, uh, perform additional tasks, tasks that generally more skilled professionals do. Um, and there are many, many different examples of these in services from long-term care to retail to education where new technologies can be developed and deployed in ways that actually uh, increase the range of tasks um, that um, uh, less educated uh, workers do, um, make uh, them more productive uh, at what they're doing by increasing their agency, their control over their work, the autonomy, the range of, of, of services they can provide. And, and in the process also make them more productive, which is of course the way that you would be also increasing the demand for their services. So one, one proposal that, that I've made um, uh, is really to think about a, an, an ARPA, that is in this, uh, you know, the US has these systems of, you know, um, promote, you know funds for promoting uh, advanced technologies started with DARPA. Uh, there's an ARPA for um, uh, for um, uh, renewable energies. There's now an ARPA for uh, um, in health. Uh, so the proposal is an ARPA for the workers. You know, sort of thinking about techno technologies that will uh, be focusing specifically um, on 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 helping workers, and that would be part of a, a kind of a, a a strategy that moves away from saying that well, you know. You know, all the adjustment on the part of society has to be on the part of sort of workers skilling up and adjusting themselves to the new technologies, but also we should actually also adjust technology to the needs of societies and to workers. And there's a lot of, you know, a, a range of choice that we make when we develop new uh, and implement new technologies that, you know, uh, you know Amazon could uh, deploy technology in a way that basically um, uh, uh, ha, you know, controls the workers and has you know, much more uh, information about what worker is doing. Um, and that's one way you can deploy the technology. Another way would be to actually get the worker to do a lot more than ex expand the range of, of choices and autonomy and, and uh, decision maker that that worker can can make. And there are, there are two different paths for uh, increasing productivity. Um, but one, of course, is much more uh, beneficial to workers than the other. And finally, um, I think that uh, sort of these new type of, of um, um, industrial policies also have to come with a, a, a new model of uh, governance. And the traditional way that we think about industrial policy is a kind of a very top-down, arm's length model of regulation where a bunch of technocrats ex ante select the certain types of industries or technologies to support, then apply ex post very hard conditionality. Um, but what we another thing that we've learned from the practice of uh, industrial policy is that even when we where we think that this is what has been done, such as sort of the, the you know the the um, the classic industrial policies of Japan or South Korea or Taiwan. In practice, their models have been somewhat different, that it has been a much more kind of a process of iterated strategic collaboration with private firms rather than simply this top-down, arm's-length relationship where there are these very hard uh, rules. Um, so uh, this kind of relationship is, is, is much more one that, that the government, uh, together with private sector agents, is involved in, in a process of first you know, setting broad goals about what you want to achieve. For, it could be number of jobs that are created, for example. Um, a, a process of discovery of what are the critical public inputs that are missing and how can we provide them coordinating the, the activities of different uh, service providers. The conditionality is taking the form of essentially soft conditionality rather than hard conditionality, not the stick that will remove any assistance, but all that we require is that you're engaged in, in good faith efforts um, to, uh, to, to work with us uh, towards the um, uh, achievement of these goals. A process of monitoring and learning to see whether things are working or not, Prep, you know, being prepared to revise goals in light of new information that comes up, and a system that actually fosters a lot of experimentation around these principles of trying different kinds of things. Now, 
Uh, these might sound sort of sort of abstract and, and pie in the sky, but the truth is that that these practices already uh, exist in a variety of domains, everywhere from sort of this DARPA model that I've just mentioned to sort of very successful local economic development coalitions that effectively uh, practice a brand of this. Uh, but they haven't really become a kind of central model around which uh, the practice of industrial policy really uh, revolves. So um, I've gone a little bit over uh, over my time, for which I apologize, but I think I, I, I tried to cover maybe um, a little bit uh, too much. Uh, but at this point, uh, this is just a summary of some of the sort of differences between uh, traditional and, um, and, and more uh, modern or contemporary approaches to industrial policy. Maybe I will just uh, simply at this point just sh stop sharing my, my slides and turn it over uh, to you, Amra. Many thanks for this excellent talk. Um, now we have some time for questions. So if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. Uh, we have Alessandro Basso to ask a question. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Fantastic. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed uh, this uh, this talk. Uh, I I have a question about uh, the, the part in which you talked about uh, the empirical evidence uh, of the how effective industrial policy can be. You said that uh, we cannot probably have uh, a good uh, evidence overall because uh, the causal structure is too complicated, but we can perhaps find some evidence that highlights some parts and bits that are compatible with, uh, with the bigger picture of the, the effectiveness of industrial policy. So I'm, I'm wondering um, if you think of this kind of uh, uh, parts and bits evidence uh, to be that it would be specific for some specific interventions, or would it be broadly for the industrial policy interventions of a of a of a government? And how confident are you that this will be enough for addressing these debates on on how to to do it and how to do it well? Yeah, thank you for that. I I think that's a fantastic question and. Um... Uh, look, I mean, I, I, I think it's it's important to, you know, continue doing this research, but I think it's also important to sort of to broaden uh, the remit of this research, you know, and 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 I, I think it's it's so I, you know, I remain a little bit skeptical that this research will will can resolve this question because you know, so much depends on, on context and so much depends on how we think about this. And ultimately, as I argued, you know, none of this directly answers the question of whether industrial policy worked or not, even in that particular context. At best, we have one part of the question being answered without having the full. Um, so, yeah, I mean, so when, when we find, for example, that as in some of the papers that we mentioned that you know, regional subsidies in southern Italy sort of worked to promote employment and investment. Or when we find, uh, as in the case of another party uh, uh, paper, that uh, investments, uh, investment capital subsidies, capital investment subsidies to lagging regions in Britain um, helped expand investment and employment in the smaller and medium-sized enterprise sector in those regions. So I think it helps us, you know, sort of recalibrate our priors. So you might have started from the premise that, oh, you know, Britain and Italy, you know, two countries where industrial policies and regional policies have failed utterly. And then this evidence, you know, should at least help you sort of revise your priors a little bit. You might still remain skeptic for a variety of other reasons, in particular for the reason that, you know, let's say in the case of the British paper, it's really exploiting a kind of an exogenous variation uh, 
uh, in which part, which regions got uh, subsidized, which not, and you might remain worried that in practice, the actual deployment of subsidies will be politically driven. So therefore that this paper doesn't necessarily say much uh, about the, the problem you're concerned about. So I think it marginally sort of helps you update your priors without necessarily resolving that question. Where I think we also need to do more work uh, is actually sort of look at industrial policies in a broader kind of a sense. So when these papers, and I, maybe it's sort of inherent to the econ economic method, is that they're looking at very concrete instruments that can be measured, how much were the subsidies. Um, and um, uh, whereas, you know, if you look at some of the details of the uh, the program in Britain, it well, didn't really involve only um, uh, subsidizing firms, but there was a, a, a process of interacting with the firms to see what was happening. So there's that kind of learning that's going on in terms of, and, and that can create, a, a, you know, that can lead to a much richer kind of industrial policy that goes beyond simply subsidizing and, pro and more in the direction of, of helping firms in a variety of different ways uh, for example, this provision of public inputs that I was suggesting in my presentation. So there, I think we can do a lot more empirical work to expand the way that 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 we are analyzing industrial policy. And that's something that I'm trying to do with my work with Gordon Hansen uh, um, uh, in, term, in, 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 in the United States, looking at local economic development policies. So I think th those are some of the ways I think, you know, empirical policy actually might help. But again, I don't think it's going to sort of nail down, even in a particular context, in a particular historical moment where an industrial policy worked or not. So, so I don't know if I directly answered your question, but that's sort of how I would look at it. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Patricio Laina. Hi, I'm Patricio Laina. Uh, I work as a chief economist at the Finnish Confederation of Professionals, SDPK. Uh, and uh, I have questions related to the state of industrial policy in, in Finland or uh, EU uh, relative to the perhaps a bit bolder approach of the US and, and China. Uh, well, uh, as you probably know, that uh, new fiscal rules are kicking in next year in the in the EU, and also perhaps the state aid rules are being restored, uh, and we don't have any common uh, financing instruments if, if you don't take into account the very modest step instrument that we now have. Uh, so my first question is how to combine industrial policy with austerity. Uh, which is probably kicking in in Europe uh, quite soon. And the second question is that what, what is the scope and potential instruments for industrial policy here in Finland or, or Finland as a part of the EU? Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a broader um, sort of discussion on sort of how to, how to re reconfigure state aid policies uh, in light of um, sort of these the recognition that industrial policies may have to play an important uh, role. So I think you know state aid uh, rules in 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 the EU already have important sort of exceptions, right? Uh, lagging regions is one uh, where you're allowed to provide state aid. So more recently we have the green transition where you have another sort of set of exceptions where you're allowed to subsidize. So I think already, I think the, the state aid rules in the EU have incorporated the idea that when you have important public goals, whether it is helping lagging regions or helping the green transition, that state aid uh, disciplines have to be um, uh, uh, relaxed. So I would actually sort of move on that principle, which is to say that, well, it's not just lagging regions, it's not necessarily even just sort of the green transition, but I think good jobs um, is also uh, a, an important um, uh, um, uh, uh, priority. Um, uh, also, sort of innovation. I mean, the, you know, you think about innovation as a kind of a horizontal policy, but of course, you're always making these choices, and I think one has to be, you know, better uh, conscious about that. So, I think having the discipline that individual states, member states, have to provide a certain level of justification to the Commission when they are engaging in. 
aid policies to particular sectors or technologies or regions. That's a good discipline. But I think it shouldn't be the presumption shouldn't be that, you know, that the, you know, Brussels has the right to veto. Uh, but the presumption has to be that there has to be an accountability that when you're engaging in this, that you can, you can rationalize your policies on the basis of good economic arguments, that this is a valid rationale for policy, and this is a valid um, uh, 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 way of going about it. Um, so I think that discipline is a good thing uh, to have. But, uh, you know, but in general, I think, you know, we probably will need to move in the direction of relaxing, relaxing those restrictions. I think, I mean, Finland is, I think, to me, it seems like a country that's always made these distinctions. I mean, these, these, um, uh, you know, these, you know, having selecting and focusing on particular areas of technology and supporting it with, um, uh, you know, quite um, a lot of not subsidies, but simply coordination, right, around universities, around sort of with, with big firms and working around that. So I think in some sense, Finland is an example of what I'm talking about as, as sort of this coordinating function uh, of industrial policy around a particular kind of a vision. And often I think that also points to the uh, to another sort of key point that I was making that you know we shouldn't think about industrial policy purely or even largely or even mostly as as subsidies. It's really about working with firms and innovators and startups and and um, investors and trying to find out where are some promising areas and what are how can you know, the state and government can provide some of the missing uh, inputs that will be needed to get these activities going. Um, and it's it's not necessarily, you know, uh, I wouldn't rule out subsidies, but it's, if, if you start the, the, the conversation from the standpoint of subsidies, it always gets then stunted into, okay, what, what can we get from the firm? What can we get from the government? What kind of tax incentives can we get? As opposed to what are the problems that we collectively have to solve? What is it that we have to do jointly to increase innovation and investment and productivity. And that's a that's the type of conversation that I would like government agencies to have with universities and innovators and firms. Um, and, and that's the kind of industrial policy that I think works best, which I, I think is, is essentially what Finland has been very good at. Thank you. Next, we have Don Ross. Thanks, Emra. Thanks very much for the very stimulating talk. I'm Don Ross. I'm a professor of economics at the University of Cape Town. Um, one theme I didn't hear, I'd be interested to hear you say something about because I didn't see it come up so much in, in the talk. Um, you know, naturally in South Africa, we have, we when we when we engage in industrial policy, we're, we were, we're quite focused on trying to encourage firms to use labor intense to use technology in labor intensive ways in particular to use materials or installations where the maintenance can be done by relatively low skilled labor and sometimes it might be more expensive to install but you know can, can we help incentivize firms to to do that and one of the problems we hit because of our recent history of corruption we're under a lot of pressure to do things in very transparent ways uh you know it might it might there might be ways in which if we could close all the doors and get together one firm at a time, we could we could more easily do these kinds of creative uh, co-production initiatives. But when we're required to be very transparent, uh, then since we also have a concern about concentration, firm concentration, we keep tripping over competition policy. Uh, in other words, the more the more we try to engage more specifically and in a granular scale with individual firms or with across sectors, the more we're sending signals that help the incumbents, that the incumbents can use more efficiently than the than the, the new firms and the competition policy keeps blowing whistles on us. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't see in your talk mention of those kinds of tensions, which which we keep, yeah, I'm just saying yeah. we keep track of them. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the potential, I mean, you're raising a lot of different um, Issues. Some of them are general in the sense that it would also apply a lot to the discussion in, in the EU context on the relationship between competition policy and industrial policy. And, I, and there I would just generally say that, that I, I, I don't view them necessarily in tension with each other as long as competition policy takes uh, a view that uh, recognizes that the 
the, the market failures or externalities which industrial policy targets are all in the remit of the type of consumer welfare maximization that computer competition policy uh, is focusing on. So to the extent that we understand that our objective is simply not to maximize market competition, but to do so in a way where externalities are also being internalized, there's nothing inherently uh, um, uh, you know, that a conflict between competition policy, industrial policy. I think in practice, the, 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 uh, the conflict arises because competition authorities you know, tend to focus on the things that they can measure, things like market concentration and, and so forth, and, 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 and treat things like, you know, learning spillovers and other sort of productive upgrading problems as very skeptically as arguments that firms are going to make um, uh, before their own rent-seeking purposes, but are not grounded. So I think, but that's not, I, I don't think that's a very good argument. I think we just need to be more creative about thinking of competition policy in ways that is actually taking uh, problems of, uh, you know, sort of productive uh, innovation, externalities, coordination issues, and so forth seriously. And I think it can be done. Uh, so conceptually, certainly there is no uh, no um, uh, uh, conflict there. Now, in, in the case of, of South Africa, is I think it's, um, it's um, you know, um, I often say that, that there is no industrial policy that South Africa has not tried. Um, there's everything on the sun that you can think of, that there is some version of it that DTI or some, some other you know, part of the government has actually engaged in. And, uh, and, um, and, 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 and so there is, to me, you know, until at least very recently, the focus has been you know, uh, too much on the manufacturing sector. Now, I think there's, there's limits to how much labor absorbed in, you know, even if focusing on, on sort of more labor intensive uh, parts of processes in manufacturing, I think, you know, it, it's the time is past gone where South Africa can get, generate enough jobs in autos and, and textiles and uh, sort of other, you know, manufacturing sectors. I think you know the 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 bulk of the work in terms of creating additional sort of better jobs, uh, you know, sort of in in South Africa will have to come from the creation of of sort of, you know, sort of more uh, service activity, including by sort of informal firms. And there's there's a relative lack of actually informality and in in, in 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 South Africa compared to other countries, and given the level of un unemployment uh, that exists in, in South Africa, so that that's a very different type of um, uh, industrial policy. I think Harun Borat, in, in your colleague, I believe, I think has actually um, ha has done some interesting work on thinking. If you're looking at the, you know, creating jobs for the micro enterprises, self proprietorships, or the smaller or, or you know, somewhat larger, you know, you know, uh, enterprises with five or ten people. What kind of public services are actually required to ensure that you can actually create employment at that level? Because that's really potentially a much larger labor absorption uh, uh, potential than 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 in manufacturing. And then that, that's kind of then the, the kind of policies that you focus on is really you know, licensing hawkers and whether you provide them with space, you know, whether you create platforms, whether you can they'll sell savings, whether, you, you know, the degree to which you can expand your, you know, your, your employment subsidy scheme so that, you know, smaller firms can actually hire, um, uh, you know, um, uh, young workers and keep them on and so forth. So it's a very different range of interventions uh, than, um, than what, we have thought of normally sort of in the context of, of South Africa with its fact, you know, focusing on autos and so forth. Thanks very much. I mean, my, my focus is mostly on infrastructure, public infrastructure provision rather than manufacturing. And that's where we, where we again, we try to focus on more innovative materials that soak up more labor. And that's where we're hitting the, because we've got, that's where we're hitting competition policy problems. Interesting, but, yeah. Thank you. Well, again, that, but that's an interesting point because I think, in some sense, you know, you know, again, you know, from a competition standpoint, you know, it's it, it, you have to think about if there are there's important gap between, you know, the you know the um, with lots of you know the social uh, you know benefit of hiring additional workers, 
is that you know you also want to sort of put that in into your you know maximand when you're thinking about what the objective function of your competition authority ought to be. But how do you do that, and how do you incorporate that? Uh, is it is going to take some differences in the way that competition authorities typically sort of operationalize their work? Yeah. Thank you. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we have Melissa Vergara Fernandez. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting and stimulating talk. Uh, I just so I, I found it very interesting because uh, you have this perspective of uh, focusing on the importance of employment, and uh, uh, it seems uh, that um, well, it goes counter somehow to the 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 reason for why industrial policy has been kind of taken uh, so much importance with relation to the climate uh, business and trying to, uh, well, sort out the energy transition. So I was wondering whether you could say something about whether you think that this is likely, say, to be ineffective, uh, the whole uh, industrial policy for the sake of the energy transition. Uh, and if so, say maybe in terms of priorities, uh, yeah, would you say that perhaps a better perspective would be really just to focus on, on employment and that maybe the energy transition is not as important? Or how would you yeah, say that there's the relationship between these two yeah, uh, purposes or goals for governments? No, thank you for, for giving me a chance to clarify that. I, I mean, I I don't doubt for a second that the green transition uh, requires its own industrial policies and our our critical priority. Um, so, um, I I'm in favor of IRA in the U.S. I think the green uh, subsidies in China and solar and, and and wind have done the world a huge favor by bringing the cost of renewables down. I think IRA today is likely to do the same. Um, so I'm all for it. What I'm what I'm saying is that that is not on its own going to address the good jobs problem. Uh, and that sort of so that's a different objective that requires its own set of industrial policy that will often take a very different form because it'll target um, you know it, different types of sectors. It's not going to be you know EV and batteries and you know, green hydrogen and all of that stuff, it's going to be these labor absorbing sectors is going to be care, long term care, personal services, retail, very different kinds of, of sectors that will require different, you know, the instruments will be the same, will be very different. In the case of IRA, we have these subsidies and grants, uh, tax incentives for jobs, you know, we'll need to think about um, these you know, um, uh, specific public inputs and helping firms uh, develop um, com 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 competences, you know, specific worker-friendly technologies for care and retail and things like that. So very different types of instruments and approaches uh, for jobs. It'll have to be much more local than national or federal because they really require when you're dealing with smaller firms, you know, that you need to be closer to them. You can't run it from the national capital. So municipalities or depending on federal structure, you know, regionals or, or, or sub-national governments will have a much bigger role to play than necessary, than in the case of, of, of uh, the green transition. Those are two almost equally, I mean, I would say that if, if the green transition is addressing our, you know, our, our most important existential threat to our physical environment, I would say that the good jobs is addressing the most significant threat to our to our social uh, environment in terms of the erosion of the middle class and and the divisions of society uh, in terms of low labor market polarization. So they're very both important for their own reasons, and and they need their own instruments. They need their own versions of industrial policy. So I, I haven't talked about the green industrial policy. It's not because I don't think it's it's unimportant. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Oswaldo Feinstein. Hello. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I, I appreciate very much the, the, your presentation, but I wonder to what extent does it make sense to continue calling 
these type of transformative targeted policies, industrial policies. That seems to be a sort of path dependence. And it might be even negative in terms of uh, persuasion. I think that uh, your approach, which I fully share, seems to be much broader than the industrial policy. And it might be a misnomer to call it like that. In fact, it's very interesting that your conceptual framework doesn't make any reference to industries. And even uh, towards the end of the talk, you were referring to the future of industrial policies and industrial between quotes. So why don't we call them transformative policies, uh, transformative and um, uh, targeted policies? Thank you. I, 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 I agree with you. And I agree that there is a kind of, um, uh, you know, um, uh, um, you know, it's more, and, and maybe because of all the negative connotation of industrial policy in, in different parts of the technocracy and in the economics discipline, maybe it would be good to, to jettison the term altogether. So there are different other terms, like, you know, sometimes they use, I think, in, in, in Latin, so when these policy came back in fashion in Latin America, um that uh, because industrial policy was such a had such negative connotation rather than using industrial policy for example the i think the inter-american development bank started talking about productive development policies right who can be against productive development policies but it was really talking about industrial policies with a different uh term uh i think when in africa rather than talk about industrial policies you know i think it was a lot about structural transformation policies rather than uh, industrial policies. I also like your you know, transformative uh, targeted uh, policies. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think you're right because I mean it's it's become a misnomer because, as I said also that much of it is not going to be focused on industry at all. Um, so i'm I'm very sympathetic to what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Otta uh, Tori Bonen. Hi, right, thanks for an interesting talk. I, I have actually two questions, if I may. Well, so let me be brief. Uh, you quite sensibly said that industrial policy is not just about R&D subsidies. It's also about talking to uh, people, entrepreneurs and so on. Uh, in a country as corporate as Finland, uh, that often amounts to having the same representatives of the same uh, industry uh, organizations at the table. And so, how can one engage the entrepreneur who's going to set up the trans transformative startup business three years from now? Uh, so that's question one. Question two, uh, there are obvious important links with industrial policy and other policies. Something that already came up was competition policy. But especially given your emphasis on, on the objective of, of creating good jobs, what are the links to education policy? uh that uh you would see as important thank you yeah thank you now on on corporatism and talking to sort of the established uh, firms i think you're you're absolutely right so i think you know as as i think as as the relevant government agencies would have to be very conscious that they want to be maintain a process that's sort of you know open uh, to entrance and potential entrance. And there are various ways to do that. I mean, one way, you know, is, is you know, generally trying to avoid sort of discussing these issues with sort of, you know, peak organizations where I think it very, you know, dominated by large incumbents and where the conversation always then becomes about, you know, taxes and regulations in general terms rather than very specifically the needs of niches or different subsectors. So having the conversation at a technical level about sort of what are the obstacles to productivity in, you know, in, in our nascent, uh, you know, photonics uh, sector. Um, and, and so, you know, that sort of moves, makes it very different because then these should become very specific to that niche. Um, other strategies are to sort of maintain sort of like windows or, business competition. So we can have windows for any potential um, uh, firm or group of partners to come in and uh, bid for 
uh, for for subsidies or for for assistance. Uh, so in the United States, you know, for example, one of the nice things that have happened, although not at the scale I would like to see, is you know that the Biden administration has created these various challenges. So here's a bunch of funds here, you know, that you can simply come to the government. You could be anybody. Uh, just come to the government and say, I want to develop good jobs or I want to sort of invest, create investment in this particular region. Here's my plan. Um, can you, you know, help me finance it or can you co-finance it? So having windows that are so essentially open to anybody or creating sort of competitions business plan competitions or other things that are sort of co-financed by the government. So there might be also strategies to open up the process. Um, on, on education, yeah, I mean, I think the, one of the things that I think we learn in sort of, especially with respect to workforce development and vocational training is that the programs that work best uh, often looks like some version of industrial policy. And what I mean by that is that they are programs that aren't directly working very closely with the trainees and the educational institutions that are providing the training, but also working very closely with the firms that are the demanders on the demand side. So, you know, the most successful um, sectoral uh, workforce uh, training programs in the United States have what's called um, a kind of a, a dual client approach. They view themselves explicitly as serving two clients. One is the trainee, uh, the potential worker. The other is actually the firm. So they're working together. And the purpose is actually to create a kind of a, a relationship of trust where the sectoral uh, training agency is able not only to learn um, uh, the, uh, the needs of the firm so they can invest in the right kind of training, but also to actually over time shape the human resource practices of these firms in ways that these firms can be more responsive uh, to the needs of the workers too, uh, in terms of creating worker classifications or job descriptions that fit, fit actually better uh, with the supply of, 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 um, of, 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 of training. So this is this kind of training or education that's at the intersection of what sort of you know business development and and working with firms and workforce development, I think is probably the most uh, interesting uh, uh, part of this um, uh, of this, this this discussion. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, time for one more question, and next we have Asap Savashakat. Thank you, Danny. As always, uh, great. Uh, you know, I practically read everything you write, so <clears throat> uh, I've been following the evolution. Uh, you know, you helped us, I think, a lot in in being better economists, and you continue to do so. And this is an excellent summary of of your work. Maybe we'll have the uh, presentation uh, available. <laughs> Yeah, so that we can also use it for our students. Anyway, uh, I fully agree with most most of the things you say. Uh, especially, I find the uh, the the, uh, the emphasis on the demand for good jobs. You know that we should look. I mean, there's been too much emphasis on providing skills, education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I mean, I I can think of Turkey. Uh, you know, so what if we had educated? a million computer engineers and we have no computer industry so they would all be working in, 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 in Europe and China or wherever, where, wherever there is a computer industry. You have to really coordinate. There's a, there can be a serious coordination failure. There's no doubt about it. And the market solution is, is really a cobweb. You know, if you, if, you, if you train computer engineers without the computer industry, the salaries will go down so nobody will want to study computer engineering, you know, so you, you can't solve that to the market. Okay, but uh, the thing that worries me a little bit, and you understand that as I'm coming from Turkey, is the services uh, part, uh, you know, uh, because uh, we, we already have it, as you know, a, a, a large tradables in us deficit in the, in the manufacturing industry, deficit from the external trade. So clearly, uh, the size of the manufacturing industry is too small. Uh, Turkey's, Turkey's problem doesn't seem to 
come from lack of productivity and services, but too large of a service sector compared to its manufacturing sector, which results in large manufacturing deficits. Now, this is the first observation. Secondly, uh, when we look at the successful countries, uh, we look at uh, uh, also countries which have solved the aggregate demand, the old Keynesian problem, by exporting their savings abroad. So, uh, you know, fast growth. So maybe this fast growth, which is it comes about through exporting your aggregate demand problem to other countries, uh, allows you to make mistakes in industrial policy. Even if your industrial policy is not that, that successful, because of your success in solving the aggregate demand problem, that you look, you're successful, and then people, so that there's, there can be a little bit of confusion. It just puzzles me. So I'm wondering, what do you think about yeah. this? these two points? <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Asaf. Thanks for, I think that's a, that's a great question. So I, I would, I would, I would answer by saying there are, there are you no know, sort of, you can't hit all your targets with, you know, the same instruments. So I would say that the problem of, um, aggregate demand and creating a reasonably full employment economy, dealing with your trade imbalance. Um, if you look at countries that are doing really well on that score, you know, it could be, you know, look at manufacturing countries with large manufacturing trade surpluses like China, starting with China um, or, or Korea or, or, or Germany. Um, so, you know, maybe, yeah, I mean, you you maybe you want to strengthen your manufacturing to kind of replicate their um, their success. Maybe you want to have aggregate demand policies that are creating an export surplus and so forth. Um, no, that's fine. That's, you know, that's serving that objective. But it's not going to address the problems of, you know, how do you create a a, a kind of a labor, mar labor market that is creating a, 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 a goods broad uh, social middle class um, because if you look at all these countries that you know that are just named that are successful in, in terms of trade surpluses in manufacturing they're all losing including China they're losing workers in uh, manufacturing as a share of labor force so there the employment the industrialization is happening everywhere including the countries that are doing the best in terms of uh, the producing manufacturers and becoming globally competitive. Uh, so that I think require that 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 objective of becoming an important supplier, let's say to Europe of uh, manufacturing parts and manufacturing goods, I think should be part of Turkey's uh, growth strategy. That doesn't solve the problem of where will the good jobs in the economy come from because they're not going to come from these you know exporting sectors. And so you will need a strategy of you know creating good jobs in the rest of the economy that's going that's not going to be agriculture because agriculture is not going to be you know go back to being a labor absorber so you'll have to be services so it's by process of elimination that i come to that you know uncomfortable conclusion it's not that i think this is going to be easy this is really it's just going to be i think that's that's we don't have any other choice and i think that's why you know i think we need to to focus on services and employment labor absorbing sectors and seeing how we can make them uh, work explicitly on their productivity um but so that's all i would say thank you thanks everyone for the questions and for being uh, with us today i just want to note that uh, if we can manage it the video will be online within two two weeks so you can find it on our web page. Uh, so uh, we are out of time and I have to finish this. So uh, Daniel Jam, uh, many, many thanks for this great talk and thanks everyone for joining us today. Thank you, it was great to have you. And thanks for joining. Thank you all, bye-bye.